UIs can quickly become complex spaghetti monsters of interdependent scripts and screens. In this video, you'll learn a way to manage your UIs to prevent all that from happening to keep your UI clean, easy to maintain, and solid. Hey, Chris here from Mom Academy. Here to help you. Who, me? Yes, you. Make your game dev dream become a reality by helping you manage your UIs in UI Toolkit. Let's start by walking through the components of this framework and why we may want to structure our UIs this way. First, because UI pages or views tend to be self-contained, or at least they should be, this makes them a great candidate for templates. And a template in UI Toolkit is basically just a bundle of UXML, USS, and optionally a backing class. For a complex thing like a page or a view, it's going to have a backing class. The template has to be initialized to hook up that c -sharp class with that UXML so the class knows about which specific elements on the screen it should be dealing with. And if you want to learn more about templates, I recently covered how to make templates and how they work. I'll have a link in the description and a card on the screen. Now, since there's likely going to be many views, it makes sense for us to have an abstract or a base class that we should derive all of our views from. So we can lift up some of the common stuff that we see across all of those views. I called this a UI view, and it has some common configuration like, should it be hidden on awake? Is it an overlay? It provides the interface to get initialized, took up that backing class to that UXML based on the root visual element that that template is being injected on. Then it just defines some functions that every single view is going to need to do its own custom logic for, such as getting references to all of those elements on the screen and registering any event handlers. I also did some convenient things like having show and hide transitions on this class. Then we just derive any views that we want from that class, do all the custom logic, and then we just need a main controller class that's a mono behavior that we attach to the UI document to tie it all together because these UI views are not mono behaviors, they're standard C -sharp classes. With that main controller class, it acts as a mediator between all of these different views. It can load data, make sure it initializes all of these views with the correct data and can listen for events that are raised by any of these views and provide any additional context as it comes up to any other view. This keeps all of those views from having to know about each other because we have that one mediator in between them all. With that overview in mind, let's take a look at the concrete examples of how I implemented this in the free and open source mini golf micro game with the full projects on GitHub and the full game on itch if you want to follow along. You first need to have a UI document, which I have here called main menu as the UI document with the UXML that we want to see. And we have that main menu script, which is our menu controller that's going to know about all of the pages or views that we want to display. You, of course, have to have your UI built out. And in this case, you can see we have a menu container. I'll set all these overlay opacities to zero. We've got our main menu container here that has some buttons. And when you click on each button, it's going to do something like show one of these overlays. For example, if you click play, it's going to pull up this level selection template, which is a UI view. And while I don't want to get into the whole process of creating templates, because I did cover that in a previous video, let's take a look at the level selection modal. When you're creating different views, you make your own UXML template like this one, the level selection modal, where you just put the specific thing you want to show in this UXML and attach whatever specific USS that you want to have for that template. In this case, we just have a text label and a close button, and then a scroll view that will populate with some elements at runtime. Designing our UIs with all of these template views allows us to very easily isolate those changes so we don't just have one gigantic UXML document with all of these things going on. Now we can hop over into Writer, which is now free for non-commercial products. And if you are doing a commercial product, I've got a code LOM Academy where you can save 25% on an annual subscription. Got details in the description for that as well. Let's come over into our main menu. This one has a little bit more stuff going on because it handles rotating the camera around the ball. We're going to focus on this stuff here that has to do with the UI. We have some buttons that when we click on them, they'll show us some of these level selection about or how to play modals. Each one of these is a UI view. And like we were talking about earlier, the UI view gives us some common configuration, such as should this thing be hidden on awake? Is it an overlay? What's the root visual element for this view, as well as some constructors and very importantly, this initialize function. If you try to initialize with a null element, we'll throw an exception saying, hey, you can't do this, you messed up something. 
Then we'll call set visual elements and register button callbacks. So the initialization process is standardized across all of these views. We set up our visual elements, we register the button callbacks, and if hide on awake is true, we'll also hide this view. Because I have a bunch of modals, this was very important. We don't want to show them until we click a button, so we hide them on awake. Down a little bit more, we have set up visual elements, which any subclass should have to go and find all the elements that it needs to function in this function. Register button callbacks then will set up Hey, after we found all these things, maybe we want to register a button click. Maybe if the mouse moves a certain way, we're going to do something. All of that we handle in these two functions. And then we have our show and hide functions down here, which just toggle some classes. And I've got some USS to manage some animations there. This UI view is pretty simple, but also very powerful. Let's take a look at our level selection. Now the level selection will show to the player based on the configured level SOs, which levels are available, what the par is, what your top score is, all of these types of things. So it needs a little bit more information than just, hey, here's my UI view and I'm gonna find all my elements. It does have a scroll view and a close button, but it needs stuff like which levels are available, what levels has the player completed and what score did they get? So that's where we see this level selection constructor. And we'll see on a wake of main menu, we load data about the player's level completion data, and then we construct a new UI view, a new level selection. We find the template we're gonna be operating off from. We provide all of the levels that are available and the level completion data. So the level selection view can do whatever it needs to do. You'll notice we also listen for an event. That way the view doesn't have to know what to do. It just knows that something happened and our main menu controller here knows, hey, on level selected, we're gonna store the level data that we're gonna load and we load that scene and then it dynamically builds out the scene on the game scene. So let's come back to the level selection. We set up whatever configuration we need on our constructor and we call initialize. This is the base implementation of initialize. So we're gonna do set the visual elements, register the button callbacks, and then hide ourselves because we set hide on await to true. The level selection view is a little bit more complex because we're dynamically building stuff out. So when we set up the visual elements, we're not just querying for elements on the screen. We do that first, then we dynamically build out some visual elements and add them into our scroll view. And what's interesting about this UI level is it's also UI view. It doesn't have to be a whole page. This is just a small container, but we're following the same process. Again, set visual elements, finds all of the elements on the UXML. We set whatever values we need and that's it. This one doesn't have any click handlers, but we do want to have a click handle because the level selection UI view needs to respond when the player clicks anywhere on that UI level. We're registering the callbacks here instead of having the UI level register a callback and raise some events. Once we've made this UI element and it's been initialized, we're adding it to our scroll view and we make sure we scroll to the top. So all of this is just setting up the UXML stuff. If we come down a little bit, we've got register button callbacks where we just register, hey, when you click on the close button, we're gonna do something, we're gonna hide, which we're just calling the base hide and setting picking mode to ignore so we can click through this thing. That's the main work going on here that's related to how the UI views are working. There's some more specific game logic here, but we're not trying to get too much into that. We're just using this as a concrete example of how we implemented this framework. Next, let's take a look at how we can communicate between this view and the menu controller. Whenever we click on one of these UI elements, we want to raise an event because we, as the UI view, don't know what needs to happen when these things are clicked. We just want to say, hey, this one was clicked and let our main menu be the one who controls all of that stuff because it probably needs to know more than just that to respond properly. So we can define delegate voids as handlers. So we wanna say, hey, this is the level that the player clicked on, just so you know, and then we'll let somebody else respond to that. We don't need to know what to do necessarily when one of these is clicked. So we can see that this strategy here is to make this totally encapsulated. This thing only knows about its little world, about how to present the data and which data it has. It's the main menu or that root controller's responsibility to do something when things happen. And of course, this is also reused at the runtime. So we have a similar pattern here on the game scene where we have a runtime UI that has a different UI document and a different controller, the runtime UI, where the runtime UI looks like this, it still has that level selection modal. So if we take a look at our runtime UI, we're gonna see it on awake do the exact same type of stuff. So injecting a template or a view ends up being just a couple lines of code here. Create a new instance of your view, register any event handlers you need to on that view, and make sure you provided it any data that it needs. That makes reusing these views very simple and straightforward. We only have a couple lines of code. I just wanted to make sure we showed that this process is the same even when we're going across scenes. You just have a reference to your template, make the view, listen for events, and it's done. Let's take another look at a more simple one, the about modal. 
Just like what we did with the level selection modal, we create a new instance of the UI view, tell it which element is its root, it sets up some configuration, and then it initializes itself. We're using again the base initialize, and we just have these two couple of functions here, register button callbacks, where whenever we click on something like the close button, what should happen? Well, we should be hidden. Whenever you click on Patreon, it should open up the Patreon page. Whenever you click on YouTube, it should open YouTube, GitHub, GitHub. So as you can see here, they can be very simple, straightforward. Hey, just find my elements, hook up click handlers, do something whenever we click handle, and that's about it. I must say I didn't invent this interaction paradigm. It's been around for quite a while and Unity even has an example of this in the Dragon Crashers UI Toolkit sample on the Asset Store. I'll link to that in the description. And when I first checked that out, I was kind of like, wow, this is over-engineered. Why do you need to do all this stuff? And then as I started building out this game, I started needing different UI components on different scenes and reusing them multiple times. I started implementing basically the same thing that Unity implemented in the Dragon Crashers sample, which I thought was pretty funny. And if you got value out of this video, make sure you've liked and subscribed to help the channel grow, reach more people and add value to more people. If you wanna show your support, you can get yourself some Mom Academy merch right here on YouTube. You can use the affiliate links down in the description to do your Humble Bundle or your Unity Asset Store shopping, or you can become a YouTube member or Patreon supporter. Both of those will get your name up here on the screen at the end of every video, you get access to a private members exclusive Discord, and a shout out starting at the awesome tier, like Ivan, Ifiobolus, Angel, Sneddon, Mustafa, Nick5454, and Pixel Wizards. There's also all of these great supporters as well. Thank you all for your support, and I'll see you on the next video.